Hello and welcome back to Weird on the Rocks. This is a podcast that explores the weird, unusual, strange, and unexplained, all while getting our drink on. I'm your host, Katie. Today's episode is going to be interesting for those of you who are from my area, but I hope that even if you aren't, you will still enjoy this episode. I'm going to be discussing four different murderers from the area I was born and raised in, which is Humboldt County, California. Humboldt County is in Northern California, less than two hours from the Oregon border. We are those people who laugh at the Bay Area when they say they're from Northern California. If you're not from the area, you might know Humboldt County for our cannabis industry, our beaches, or our beautiful redwood forests that have been seen in some really famous movies, including Return of the Jedi, Jurassic Park, and E.T., And if you're a Netflix fan, you might have seen the 2018 original show Murder Mountain, which is about Humboldt County murders that took place within the cannabis industry. I feel like that show shed some negative light on this area and made it appear as if all of Humboldt is dangerous and involved in drugs, which simply isn't true. I've lived here in Humboldt my entire life, and I have no plans on leaving, and I feel really lucky to live in such a beautiful area. But just like every town or city, we do have violence, crime, and murders. And today I'm going to be discussing some of the most interesting true crime cases to come out of Humboldt County. Before we get going, I want to share another podcast promo with you guys. This one is from the Murderific Podcast. I love this show. It's really well researched and the host Bernadette and her co-hosts are funny and really engaging. So let's listen to their promo. Check out the Murderific True Crime Podcast hosted by Bernadette from the state of Maine. Topics will include some seriously true scary stories about serial killers, mass murderers, familicides, the missing, and unsolved cases. Go to www.murderific.com to start listening now or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Until then, we will be executing podcasts one crime at a time. All right, thanks for sending that over, and I hope you guys take the time to check out the Murderific podcast. If you would like to find my show, it's on Facebook and Instagram at Weird on the Rocks Podcast, Twitter at Weird underscore Rocks, and the website weirdontherocks.weebly.com. Please subscribe to the show wherever you're listening now. And if you're listening on an Apple product, I would love for you guys to go leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps me out. Before we get into the good stuff, I want to share this week's beverage of choice. In honor of the topic of this episode, I'm drinking yet another local beer. This one is the Peanut Butter Chocolate Milk Stout from Lost Coast Brewery. I am usually not a stout fan. They are just a little too strong and rich for me. This one is so good, though. You can definitely taste that chocolate undertone. It's just like having a dessert. This would actually be really good, like over some ice cream or something. So if you're local, you've got to check this one out. I think that they still have it out in the stores. All right, cheers, and let's get weird. On November 3rd, 1998, then 36 year old Wayne Adam Ford, a truck driver from Arcata, California, walked into the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. Ford asked to speak with an officer about some evidence he had and was directed to Sheriff Dennis Lewis. Ford then proceeded to put his hand in his coat pocket, pull out a Ziploc bag that contained a severed human breast inside, and told the sheriff, this is just the tip of the iceberg. He then proceeded to confess to Sheriff Lewis that he had killed a total of four women. Ford's first victim was that of Jane Doe, whose body was discovered in October 1997, floating in a slough in Eureka, California, at the end of Park Street. Ford said the woman was a hitchhiker who he picked up and brought back to his trailer in Arcata. 
Later, only her torso was found at first floating in the slough with 27 stab wounds. Then her arm washed ashore. Jane Doe's head, legs, and other arm were never discovered. In June 1998, another body was found, this time floating in the waters near the town of Buttonwillow in Kern County, California. The body belonged to 26-year-old Tina Renee Gibbs of Las Vegas, who was a sex worker working in the area. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation. Just four months later, the body of Lynette Dayon White, a 25-year-old sex worker from Fontana, California, was found in an irrigation canal in San Joaquin County, California. And one month later, Ford's fourth and final victim was recovered. Patricia Ann Temez, a 29-year-old from Victorville, was found floating in the California aqueduct in San Bernardino. Her cause of death was determined to be strangulation, and one of her breasts was missing, the same breast that Ford would later present to an officer in Humboldt County. Sheriff Dennis Lewis, whom Ford had confessed to, said, quote, He was remorseful and apparently had reached a point in his life where he wanted to talk about what he'd been involved in, end quote. Ford also explained that he was confessing to his crime so that he wouldn't murder his ex-wife and leave his son an orphan. Humboldt County Coroner Frank Yeager said, quote, He said he was ashamed of what he was doing and his anger was mostly directed against his wife and he was getting more angry at her every day for keeping him from seeing their son, end quote. Wayne Adam Ford sat down with officials and described the heinous murders he had committed, all of which the victims were female sex workers or hitchhikers between the ages of 18 and 29. As proof of his crimes, Ford also told officers the location of the head that belonged to the torso of his first victim, Jane Doe. They were led to a campsite in Trinidad, California. Ford said he had kept Jane Doe's body parts in his trailer freezer for a year and then moved them to this campsite where he proceeded to cook them and eat some. Brenda Godsey, who was the Sheriff Department's spokeswoman at the time, said, quote, Like any community, homicides are not unusual in Humboldt County. What was so horrific about this case, perhaps, was the number of victims to find. To have an alleged serial killer that may have killed four women, that was certainly remarkable here in Humboldt County, end quote. In April 2006, Ford's trial began, and although Ford confessed to law enforcement, he still pleaded not guilty to the counts against him and claimed that his behavior was due to a brain injury he sustained while he was a Marine. Deputy District Attorney David Mazarik made his case on the fact that the crimes committed were extremely gruesome and heinous and that Ford should pay the ultimate price for what he did to these innocent women. Public defender Joseph Canty painted a different picture of a man who had a traumatic childhood, a military injury, and was severely depressed and seeking help. He pushed the fact that Ford was remorseful for his actions and that he showed moral courage when he turned himself in. Deputy District Attorney David Mazarek closed by saying he believed Ford should receive the death penalty and that, quote, Wayne Adam Ford knows what he's done and he knows what he is, end quote. After deliberating for nearly two weeks, the jury of seven men and five women found Wayne Adam Ford guilty on four counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death and still resides on death row at San Quentin State Prison in California. In the 1970s, James Carson lived in Phoenix, Arizona with his wife and young daughter. He was a family man, had his master's degree, and was described as a great father. However, in 1977, his wife began to notice some unusual changes in her husband that she was uncomfortable with, and she decided to leave, taking with her their five-year-old daughter, Jennifer. James's wife moved every few months, afraid that he would track her and her daughter down. However, James Carson didn't seem too affected by his family's abrupt disappearance and soon began dating a woman named Susan Barnes, who was divorced with two teenage sons. The two had a whirlwind romance and quickly got married and moved to Europe to travel. James and Susan eventually moved back to the U.S. and settled down in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco, an area notorious for the hippie and drug culture. Susan and James quickly became part of their environment and began heavily taking illicit drugs and practicing mysticism. 
Around this time, James sent a letter to his daughter Jennifer, who he was back in contact with, and told her that he was changing his name to Michael because God had given it to him as a new name, and Susan changed the spelling of her name from S-U-S-A-N to S-U-Z-A-N. They also together adopted the new last name Bear, as well as some radical ideologies. Susan believed that she was a mystic who was able to see the past and future. They took on strict vegetarian diets, referred to themselves as, quote, Muslim warriors, and believed that their higher power was giving them instructions to kill those who practiced witchcraft, were homosexual, or had abortions. They believed that their higher power was trusting them with our country's future and that it was up to them alone to protect the U.S. from evil forces. In March of 1981, they committed their first murder. The victim was their roommate, Karen Barnes, a 23-year-old actress who had moved to San Francisco from Georgia and was sharing a home with Michael and Susan. Karen had been stabbed 13 times and her skull was crushed. Evidence from the crime suggested that Karen was killed by someone she knew, and Michael and Susan became the prime suspects, but they disappeared before they could be questioned. Years later, Susan confessed that along with Michael, they had killed Karen. She said that Karen was a witch and was stealing her mystic powers. Susan said that the idea of killing Karen first came to her while she was hitchhiking during a rainstorm, and every time she thought about it, the thunder would clap. She believed this was her higher power telling her to kill Karen. Susan said they stabbed her and hit her over the head with a frying pan. After the murder of Karen Barnes, Michael and Susan fled to a marijuana farm here in Humboldt County. They began work as farmhands and were described by co-workers as anarchists who advocated for a revolution and believed that a nuclear apocalypse was imminent. In May of 1982, 15 months after the murder of Karen Barnes, Michael Bear Carson shot and killed Clark Stevens, a worker on the farm with whom he had had an ongoing dispute with. Michael would later say that he believed Clark Stevens was a demon. Together, Michael and Susan tried to burn Stevens' body and then buried him under some chicken fertilizer on the farm. They then fled once again. Two weeks later, Clark Stevens was reported missing by his family, and law enforcement visited the farm and discovered his remains. Investigators also found an item that the Bear Carsons left behind at the farm, an anti-government manifesto that called for the assassination of many politicians and celebrities, including Johnny Carson and then-President Ronald Reagan. Once again, the Bear Carsons were the main suspects, but they were nowhere to be found. Six months later, Michael Bear Carson was seen hitchhiking in Los Angeles. He was picked up by police, but through some type of air, was quickly let go. Four months later, in March of 1983, Michael and Susan were hitchhiking near Bakersfield, California, and were picked up by 30-year-old John Charles Hellier, who was on his way to Santa Rosa. Sometime during the ride, Susan decided that John was a witch and that she needed to kill him. Somewhere in Sonoma County on Highway 101, a fight broke out in the car and the vehicle came to a stop on the highway. Michael, Susan, and John all got out of the car where Susan proceeded to stab John Hellier. As he was being attacked, John and Michael also were fighting over a gun, and Michael was able to get a hold of it and shot John Hellier dead. A passing by car saw this take place and immediately contacted the police. Soon, a high-speed chase between officers and the Bear Carsons took place, and eventually the police were able to stop their car and detained both Michael and Susan Bear Carson. Michael and Susan decided that they would agree to plead guilty in exchange for a press conference. During this press conference, they admitted to the three murders, saying all of the victims were witches and they were following the teachings of the Quran. However, just before the beginning of their trial, they both recanted their confessions and pleaded not guilty. The couple earned the name the San Francisco Witch Killers by the media and were both found guilty of the murders of Karen Barnes, Clark Stevens, and John Hellyer and were both sentenced to 75 years to life in prison. 
Detectives also believe that the Bear Carsons are possibly responsible for other murders in the U.S. and Europe, but do not have enough evidence to tie them to the crimes. Michael Bear Carson is held at Mule Creek State Prison, and Susan is at Central California Women's Facility. Both Michael and Susan were eligible for parole in 2015. Michael canceled his parole hearing and stated that he still held the same beliefs he did when he committed these murders and does not wish to be paroled. Susan refused to help her attorney prepare for her parole hearing and was denied parole. They will both be eligible for parole again in 2030. In 2010, Sam Christie contacted the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department about a murder he had witnessed, a murder committed by his own father, Ernest Christie Jr. Sam told deputies that 22 years earlier, in 1988, when he was only 16 years old, he witnessed his father murder 27-year-old Lysandra Marie Turpin. He said that his father held Lysandra at their home for several weeks before killing her. After the murder, his father forced him to help dispose of the body. Together, they dumped Lysandra's body in a ditch near their home in Fieldbrook, California, covered it with tires, doused it with lighter fluid, and burned her body. As proof of his claims, Sam supplied the deputies with a map where Lysandra Turpin's remains could be found. Detectives and evidence technicians followed the map and discovered teeth, clothing, and charred bones, and a forensic odontologist confirmed that the remains did in fact belong to Lysandra Turpin. Sam also told deputies that his father abused other women over the years and was a heavy user of crystal meth. He told them about a woman his father kept in a hollowed-out redwood tree stump where he tortured her. Luckily, Ernest Christie eventually let the woman go, but she never came forward to report the crime. Detectives also followed Sam's directions to this tree stump and were able to find plastic jugs, a small carpet, clothing, and hypodermic needles. Sam also told police about a time when his father tied a woman up in a fishing boat and abused her and threatened her. After coming forward with this information, detectives were able to find this woman and confirm Sam's story. Ernest Christie Jr. died in 2006 before he was ever able to be questioned about his crimes. In 2012, Sam Christie did an on-air interview with Paula Zahn on her show On the Case with Paula Zahn and was asked to relive the memories of his childhood. When asked why he came forward 22 years later at the age of 38, he told Zahn that, quote, I put all of this out of my mind for years and it wasn't until I was almost 30 and had moved across the country that I started to have nightmares and started to remember things. My dad died in 2006 and it took me a few years to get to the place where I could do more than just talk about it with a counselor, where I could go public, end quote. In the interview, Sam described his traumatic childhood growing up with his father and even remembers his father putting him in the oven as punishment as a young boy. His father told him, quote, if you talk again without being spoken to, I'll turn it on, end quote. Sam says that his mother, Claire, was the only person who gave him a sense of security and comfort in his life and that he felt she would protect him from his father. But in 1977, that would all change. Sam recalls being five years old at home with his grandmother and listening to the radio. A story broke about a boat that had sunk in the bay and that out of the two passengers on board, only one had survived. The name of the boat was The Fame, and it was his father's boat. Sam says that, quote, Even at five, I was hoping it was my mom who had survived and that my dad had drowned, end quote. He said his heart sank when he saw his father alive and well. Investigators ruled that it was an accident and that his mother was lost at sea. However, people around Humboldt County, family, and friends of Claire and Sam himself believe that this was no accident at all and that Ernest Christie murdered his own wife. When Sam was 10, his father was arrested for driving around and shooting his gun into homes. Sam moved in with his grandparents and recalls that it was the happiest time of his childhood. When his father was released, Sam went back to live with him and a revolving door of new girlfriends. 
Sam says his dad's relationships were short, often volatile, and always centered around drug use. Sam says that his father was married for a short period, but he abused his wife too. She went to the police station and reported the abuse, complete with bruises on her face. Ernest Christie Jr. went to trial for this abuse, but was found not guilty by a jury. Sam explains that everyone was afraid of his father, and it seemed like even law enforcement was scared of him too. Sam explains that he knew his father's behavior, abusive habits, and drug use were wrong, but he was also afraid of his father and conditioned to do as he was told, no matter what. In this interview, Sam was asked about Lysandra Turpin, the woman whose body he was forced to dispose of. He explained that Lysandra and his father started out in a consensual relationship, and she stayed with them for a month or so. He said that Lysandra was, quote, small and cute, but had a kind of tough attitude. I liked her, end quote. He explained that at first, things were going well between his father and Lysandra. They laughed a lot and would go out on family outings together. But quickly, Ernest Christie went back to his abusive patterns and began beating Lysandra, including tying her up and holding her captive in a bedroom for weeks. Sam came home from school one day and found her badly beaten and unresponsive. His dad told him that she, quote, wasn't getting better, end quote, and ordered him to get the car. His dad carried Lysandra's body wrapped in blankets to the trunk of the car and filled the car with old tires. They drove to a deserted road in Fieldbrook, dug a ditch, put her body in it, covered it with tires, and lit it on fire. A few hours later, Ernest Christie Jr. made his son Sam go back, climb down into the ditch, and make sure Lysandra Turpin was really dead. Sam said that after that, he had to continually reassure his father that he wouldn't turn him in because Sam was afraid he would kill him. His father said he didn't trust him and as punishment made him sleep on the couch for a year. Sam said he woke up one night to see his father fully dressed, sitting on the couch, holding a gun. He said, quote, go back to sleep. I'm still trying to decide what to do with you, end quote. Years later, in 2010, Four years after his father was dead and Sam decided to give his information to the police, he was scared of what might happen to him. Even though he supplied law enforcement with information and led them to Lysandra Turpin's remains, he was afraid they wouldn't believe his story and that he might be charged for these crimes. However, Detective Steve Quinnell describes Sam Christie as a victim himself and that nobody can truly understand what he went through and why he made the decisions he did. He also stated that he believes Sam has 0% culpability in the murder of Lysandra Turpin, and in the end, prosecutors decided not to press any charges against Sam Christie. In regards to the bravery Sam Christie showed by confessing his father's crimes and his own involvement, Detective Steve Quinnell says, quote, I have the utmost respect for him coming forward and obviously without him, this case would not have developed like it did, end quote. Sam Christie says through this experience of coming forward and opening up about his childhood, he met his long lost sister who had been given up for adoption and that facing the demons of his past has made him a better father to his own four children. On June 12th, 1982, Keith S. Hitchings and his girlfriend Shannon Pellegrini drove from Eureka, California to Ruth Lake, about a two hour drive to meet some friends and to attend the Ruth Lake Rodeo. That night, after drinking heavily, the two got into a fight and Keith left their campground on foot to meet up with some friends. The next day, June 13th, he continued to drink all day. A friend of Keith's decided he was going to head back to town and Keith decided to catch a ride with him. However, Keith's ride didn't want to take him back to the town of Eureka where he lived and instead decided to drop his highly intoxicated friend off in Lolita, a small town of less than 800, about 20 minutes from Eureka. Keith Hitchings began to knock on doors, asking people if he could stay in their homes, to which they all declined. A community member decided to call the police about this behavior. Shortly after the call, the police were driving around Lolita looking for the man who had been knocking on doors when they spotted Keith Hitchings walking along the side of the road. 
Police noticed that Hitchens' pant leg was torn and that he had multiple scratches on his arm as well as blood smears on his arms and boots. He told police that he was walking because his girlfriend had his car. He also told the officer he had a knife on his waistband, but the officer couldn't find it. Police detained Hitchens and booked him at the jail at 11 p.m. for public drunkenness. He was released early the next morning. But just a few hours after his release, a grisly scene was discovered. James and Rebecca Jensen, both in their 80s, were found dead inside their Lolita home. An intruder had broken both front windows to gain entry to the home. An autopsy showed that James Jensen died of an intracranial hemorrhaging from a skull fracture. He also had severe lacerations and bruising all over his body, leading the coroner to believe that these were from Jensen trying to protect himself. The injuries were believed to have been made by a rounded object such as a baseball bat. His wife, Rebecca, had almost identical injuries and also died from intracranial hemorrhaging. There were shoe prints left in and around the home that matched the boots that Keith Hitchings had been wearing at the time of his booking the night before. Blood from his seized boots also matched DNA from both James and Rebecca Jensen, and Hitchings' missing knife was also found inside their home. Just a few hours after being released, Keith Hitchings was arrested again. Soon after, before he had been charged with anything, Keith's girlfriend Shannon Pellegrini visited him in the county jail where a monitored conversation between the two took place. Keith told her that he didn't remember entering the Jensen's home or any of the preceding events. He told her, quote, Yeah, well, I wish, just wish I wouldn't have got drunk so I would know where I was at through this whole thing, you know, because the last I remember, I was in Fortuna going into a bar. The next thing I know, I remember cutting myself. I remember asking the guy, can I stay at his house? Then the next thing I know, I got put into the car and that is all I can remember. It is not going to be too good for me not remembering now, I don't think. End quote. On May 6, 1983, the trial court sentenced Keith Hitchings to the death penalty for the murder of Rebecca Jensen and to a consecutive term of 15 years to life for the murder of James Jensen. Ten years later, in 1993, Hitchings had his death penalty overturned by the California Supreme Court and was later reconvicted and resentenced to life with parole instead. All right, well, that's going to be it for today's episode. These are all some pretty crazy stories, and it's hard to believe that they all took place in my smallish town. Before researching this episode, I had heard about all these murders in different ways. The first murder I covered, Wayne Adam Ford, I read about in the newspaper when I was in high school. There was an article about how he had come into the police station with the severed breast in his pocket, and I remember being really shocked by that, and I remember telling my friends about it. I talked to my parents about this case recently, and they both also clearly remember when this happened and how strange it was for our area. The second case I talked about, Michael and Susan Bear Carson, I heard about through the Netflix show Murder Mountain. And as I said earlier, if you haven't seen it yet, you should definitely check it out. It was really well done. It explores an area of Humboldt County that has been deemed Murder Mountain by locals because of how many murders and missing person cases have happened there. And they predominantly are connected to the cannabis industry. This area is very rural and it's kind of like martial law out there. The police don't have the time or resources to deal with the crimes, and the people don't want the police involved because even though weed is now legal in California, a lot of these farms are not permitted or up to code. When I heard about the Bear Carsons on the show Murder Mountain, I was shocked that I had never heard of them before, especially with the name The San Francisco Witch Killers. The third case I covered, that of Ernest Christie Jr. and his son Sam, was actually brought up to me by some family members. They knew this family during the time Ernest Christie was committing these crimes, but obviously didn't know that any of this was occurring behind closed doors. My family member actually recalls seeing Ernest Christie at a funeral and telling him that he looked nice because he had shaved and dressed up and was usually really scruffy looking. And she says that it later made her feel uneasy knowing that she had talked to a man who was capable of such disgusting things and especially that she gave him a 
compliment. The Christie family is large and well-known in the area to this day, and there's actually a motel in downtown Eureka owned by the family called Christie's Motel that is actually really a dumpy and shady place. And the last case I covered, that of Keith S. Hitchings, was actually brought to my attention by the parent of a child I care for. For those of you who don't know, I'm a preschool teacher, and when I started my podcast, a parent asked me if I've ever heard about these murders, which I hadn't. So, of course, I immediately started researching it and knew I had to talk about it. I hope that this episode was still interesting for you, even if you're not familiar with this area. I'm sure wherever you're from that there have been some crazy stories to come from your town as well. And sadly, there will always be crime and murders that rock a community, no matter how small. If you're from here, I would love to hear what you think about this episode. Have you ever heard of these? Do you have a connection to any of the accused people or the victims, perhaps? This being such a small town, I'm sure there is someone listening who knows more than I do and that I was able to find online. I would love for you to reach out to me if you know anything about any of these stories. And of course, I will keep it private. I do not have to share it if you do not want me to. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Weird on the Rocks podcast, Twitter at Weird underscore Rocks, and the website weirdontherocks.weebly.com. As always, thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate every single one of you. You guys are the best. And until next time, cheers and stay weird. That was a Titan Cast episode.